Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I got to tell you, it's good to be back. I missed my family here at Robert Road. And as always, it's just a joy and a privilege to uh, meet with you all here that we get to fellowship with one another. We get to offer up praises to our Lord of the love. You know, it just, it just don't get any better than that. Sunday, my favorite day of the week. Wherever I get to be, there's always a house of worship that I can find. In your travels or whatever, make it a point. Don't miss it. I've often told you it's so important to pray. A special day of prayer today, but don't forget to do it every day. In fact, do it several times a day, and the more you do it, the more you're going to be blessed, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just pleased. Are you ready to have church today? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am. Uh, welcome, uh, friends and uh, visitors. It's, it's great to see all of you this morning. And before I go any further, let me share with you my thought for the day. Couldn't help but write this down when I came across it. Listen to the words and think about it. We cannot force someone to hear a message they are not ready to receive. But we must never underestimate the power of planting a seed. That's all where it begins, planting the seed. Your garden doesn't grow unless you plant a seed. You know, you're not going to have growth unless you go out and plant a seed. And then maybe you fertilize that seed and bring it along. And you'll see growth in those that are near, near to you that maybe don't have that relationship with the Lord. Oh, I'm just so pleased, so pleased to be able to share this message this morning. And we're going to be looking at some scripture from John 4, uh, verses 1 through 42 this morning. Not all of them, or I've been keeping you here all day, but I've, I've titled this one, Water from the Well. That's what we'll be talking about. And just as a note of interest, you know, we preachers, we get our uh, material from a host of sources sometimes from sharing with one another. And I'm no different. But the inspiration for this message this morning originated from something called open windows. Ever hear of that? Yep. How many here have heard of open windows? Boy, isn't that a great daily devotional? It is just so sweet. I love it so much. Fred mentioned the music. They always do great music here. I especially love that uh, one that said, Victory in Jesus, my family, Bluegrass Gospel Band back in the day, used to sing that so many times. I love that so much. And then it went on and on. When we all get to heaven. Wow, what a great day. I mean, we ought to be bouncing up and down and shouting glory to God because when we all get to heaven, what a great day that's going to be. Amen. Woo, I tell you, I love that so much too. I talking to a brother, your brother, earlier this week. He said something that kind of struck me. He said, Ron, he said, what did I ever do to deserve? What did he see in me? To deserve the love and the salvation that He has provided me. And I think we can all say that. Amen. What did I ever do? I was such such a sinner. But He gave me grace. He said, "Ron, I got plans for you." And here I am. But you know, but before we begin, we always. Offer anyone here that uh, has a praise report or something uh, special that you want to talk about, share with the congregation. Now would be your time. I can just talk praises all day and I don't even have to get into the sermon. You know, I'm up here pretty much standing on my own two feet. Still a little bit weak, but I'm here. Daily, I'm getting stronger. My praise is just to be here. My praise is to get to go out and share the love of God. To share the word and to walk with the Lord. Amen. Yeah. And that's where it all begins. Anyone have anything that you want to add this morning? You bet. I, I have a praise that I'm sitting with two older friends today. Everything, and it's just so good to see them. Oh. And by older, she means she's known them a long time. They're not old. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I've known them for many years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Read from you, <clears throat> excuse me, from John 4 14. 
But those who drink the water, I give, will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here again today and meet in fellowship and share the word. We thank you for your gift of salvation. That we were all saved by the stripes of your son. And we thank you for your promise of your return. You know, when we all get to heaven. Let's all give further insight into the message today. We thank you for all your many blessings. We have a new friend here at Robert Road. Baptist Church, his name is Robert, has been attending for four or five weeks now. Robert recently lost his wife Gail, 34 years. It was back in March. So pray with me, congregation, if you will, that you just shine your light on Robert. Wrap your arms of love around him and give him strength during this, uh, this time. Shower blessings down upon him. <coughs> Uh, you might wonder, this is the picture right up here in front of Robert and his dear wife, Gail, and the remains in the German understand will be next week at the uh, Veteran Cemetery. So just all keep uh, Robert in your thoughts and your prayers as uh, we move through the day and through the week. Father, once again, thank you for all your many blessings. Amen. Amen. Now, as we examine, the event in the life of Jesus and his ministry this morning, and John, we will learn that he comes to break down a lot of social barriers, cultural, racial, and traditional barriers. And he, he will attempt to turn our focus from the temporary to the eternal. And Jesus demonstrated the importance of this, the importance of loving God with all his being, and met with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength. <laughs> and you know, I think we here at Robert Road Baptist Church feel pretty much the same way. I'd be surprised if we don't. That we, as, as, as followers of Jesus, in other words, disciples, we want to love God with all our hearts, our bodies, our whole, our whole soul, and our strength. Mm -hmm. And we want to make disciples. And again, my definition of disciples is, is the fully devoted follower of Jesus. So we want to make disciples of all so they too can love God with all their hearts and souls and means. So we're going to look at these events from John uh, 4 and the teaching from the Gospels that demonstrated how Jesus interacted with others and how he called his, his followers to be in relationships with each other. Said another way, live like Jesus lived. The Apostle Paul wrote this over in the book of Colossians 121. For to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. Mm. Y'all understand that? Living for Christ and dying is even better. And ultimately, that's our goal. As disciples, once again, fully devoted followers of Jesus, our lives are to kind of emulate the character of Christ to live as he lived. Well, it's been a long time since anybody had offered her a kind word. Her life began as any others. But she made some mistakes in her life, some bad choices, some poor judgments. And her life had taken a turn for the worse. A lack of direction that left her kind of feeling ashamed of who she had become. And the people in her life, her family and her friends, they rejected her. And others mocked her. They made fun of her. They pointed at her. They whispered about her behind her back, but always kind of loud enough that she would hear those whispers. All she really wanted, folks, was some love, some acceptance, a little compassion, somebody to put their arms around her and tell her, I know 
know you make mistakes, but I love you and I care about you in spite of those things. She lived her life hoping that someone, anyone, would just love her. And this is, imagine, this is how I imagine the woman that we find in John chapter 4. We don't know really a great deal about her or her life, but we know that she lived in Sychar, which was a city in Samaria near what was known as Jacob's Well. And she would draw water from the well to meet her daily needs. But the Bible tells us that she came at the sixth hour of the day. You see, the Jewish day began at 6 a.m. So the sixth hour of the day would make it high noon. Amen. Whoa! Getting kind of hot down during the mid part of the day, wouldn't you think? Hot part of the day. You see, many, many from the from the uh, town there of Sychar, they would come out there to the well early in the morning when it was cool, and they'd draw their water. But not her. Why would she wait until the hot part of the day to come draw her water? And the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why, but we can still make some guesses based on what we read here in John chapter 4. You see, she probably didn't have the best of reputations. She'd been married five times. And now she's living with another man that's not even her husband. And I know it's just inference, but can you just imagine, think for a minute and imagine what the others in that small town besides her must have thought about her. You know how small towns are. Probably most of you do if you came from a small community. Everybody knows, or at least they think they know, all about your, let me say it a different way, busyness, huh? Yeah, all about your business. Love that gossip. You know that gossip hotline and that rumor mill just running rampant. Even in today's culture, she probably been looked down on and gossip about. Five husbands. Give me a break. Now she's working on number six. I mean, can you imagine what the people in the day must have thought about her? Can you hear the other women at the well? If she's approaching when they're still there drawing water, can you hear them? Oh, look, here she comes. I hear she's had four husbands. Oh, no. She's had five. And now she's working on six. Oh, she's married again? Oh, no, she just shacked it up. <laughs> oh, what a slut. And you know, it just goes on and on. Wow. Give me a break, huh? Day in and day out. Rumors fly about. No one at all taking the time just to talk with her a little bit. See things maybe from her point of view. Who cares about that? You see, it's just, it's much more fun to be vindictive than to sympathize or empathize with someone. Mm -hmm. Or that latest juicy gossip. That's what we're waiting for. We don't want to find out the truth. We enjoy the gossip too much. And so no wonder she comes in to draw water at the hot part of the day. She'd rather endure that burning heat of the day than to experience what she goes through. You know, the searing words and the looks from the others. She'd rather just be alone, in spite of her deep need for some love and acceptance. Well, brothers and sisters, isn't that what we all want? Some love and acceptance. So she begins her day just like any other. She waited until the sixth hour of the day, just as she did just about every day. But on this day, her trip to the well would impact her life. So she'd never be the same again. For it was on this day, this very day, she met Jesus. He was there at the well. If you've studied your scriptures, you know the story. You see, this event in the life and the ministry of Jesus that we're talking about here from John, we'll not take the time to go through all 42 verses, as I said, 
but we're going to work our way through some of them this morning and review this event and as we do that I think we'll discover some things as we as we hear the message this morning some important things that maybe we can apply to our lives today to help us in our daily walk with the Lord you see this encounter with Jesus would forever change the life of this woman and just as importantly, or maybe even more importantly, it would impact not only her, but maybe several of the people there in that small community in which she lived. You see, Jesus met her at her point of need. He was able to see beyond her past, see her for what she knew was. Resi recognizing her intrinsic value as a person loved. He met with her, and he accepted her for who she was. No judgment, no accusations, no harshness, no unkind words, just love and grace. It was the love, and the mercy, and the grace that she longed for. So as we examine this event in John chapter 4, we're going to see how Jesus related to this woman. And we'll, fo we'll focus on two important facts this morning. Two important truths, if you will. The first one is this. Jesus breaks through social barriers. Now, whether we choose to admit it or not, there's many social barriers that we're all faced with. They're out there in the world today. And unfortunately, a lot of those barriers are barriers that we made ourselves. Even within the church, we're not careful, we can make church a barrier to accomplishing the very thing that we've been commissioned to accomplish. You know, there's a Christian music group out there speaking of music. It's called Casting Crowns. Anybody ever hear any music from Casting Crowns? Yes. Yeah. They had a song titled, We Are the Body. And that song is so impressive, we're going to share a part of it we need to hear this morning. I want you to just listen carefully to the words. It's crowded in worship today as she slips in trying to fade into the faces. The girls' teasing laughter is carried further than they knew. Farther than they knew. The traveler is far away from home. He sheds his coat and quietly sinks into the back row. The weight of their judgmental glances tells him that his chances are better out on the road. But if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them there is a way? There is a way. There is a way. Jesus paid much too high a price for us to pick and choose who should come. Boy, that's certainly food for thought, don't you think? There's a whole story right there. Also kind of reminds me of another old song. It had a line in it, maybe you've heard it before. It says, let the one without sin cast the first stone. Is that the first time you ever heard that? Think about it. That the one without sin. So as we examine the scripture this morning, we're going to find that Jesus breaks through three different kinds of social barriers. Cultural, racial, and tradition. Prefacing verse 27, we know that Jesus is having a conversation with this woman. And his disciples were off in the nearby town there. They're gathering some food. When they return, let me read to you verse 27 from John 4. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? You see, at this point, the disciples were kind of stunned. <clears throat> Here he was talking to a woman. Almost unheard of back in that day, let alone a rabbi to be conversing. 
publicly for one. Especially not one on one. You see, in the first century Palestinian culture, women were not valued. They were not honored as they should be. In fact, the matter is, in many of the Middle Eastern cultures today, that still holds true if you think about it. You see, women were considered to be subpar in comparison to men. But not only was she a woman, she had such a poor reputation to go and check in the past. Let's check out verses 16 and 18. I, I hate to have you flipping back and forth, so I'll give you a minute if you want to look at it. But there's a shift in the conversation here now. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Jesus broke through that cultural barrier demonstrating to us that that woman was just as important to the Father as any man would be in spite of her checkered past. You stop thinking about it, don't we all? Don't we all have somewhat of a checkered past? But he's accepted each and every one of us. So if we're going to live like Jesus lived, we truly must break through those cultural barriers of our day. We must be really willing to reach out to those out there that are kind of set apart sometimes in the community. Maybe they're considered less, or they're, or they're considered unimportant, or they're considered unloved. And we've got to be careful not to disregard others just simply because of maybe the way they talk or maybe the way they dress. That's not what we're used to, you know. Oh, they live over in the wrong area of town. Gee whiz, we can't associate with those folks. Maybe they're struggling with some kind of addiction. Perhaps even homeless. Maybe they've been out of in and out of jail. There's no end to this list. Maybe it's just because of some kind of current social or economic status. But we, like Jesus, have to be willing to look out beyond that, beyond the checkered past, to see the person for that intrinsic value of each one that's loved by the Father. So Jesus not only broke down the cultural barriers, but he also broke down racial barriers. Now I'm going to refer you over to John 4, 1 through 3. <laughs> Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples, more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. So we know that Jesus was down there in Judea, down there by the Dead Sea. And he purposed that he wanted to return over to Galilee, over by the Sea of Galilee. The only problem was that in order to do that, he'd have to do one of two things. He wanted to travel straight north through Samaria. Or he could do what any good, self-respecting Jew would have done. And that'd be over, cross over the River of Jordan, over to the uh, east, you know, and then go north several miles. Then cross back over the river again, west, back over to reach the region of Galilee. Because heaven forbid that we would ever set foot in Samaria and defile ourselves, huh? But Jesus broke through the racial barriers of his day, and he moved with purpose through Samaria to the city of Sychar, almost as if he had an appointment. Hmm, what do you think? From John 4, 4, 6. Reading again from the New Living Translation, it says he had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jesus gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, 
sat wearily beside the well about noontime. So there he was, sitting by the well, when this woman comes to draw water. And he speaks to her. Now let's look at verse 9. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? You see, Jesus refused to accept the racial barriers of that day. And if we're going to live like Jesus lived, we too must break through the racial barriers of our day. We must begin loving our neighbors as ourselves. Recognizing that we have no more value in the eyes of God than any other person, regardless of the racial, racial or ethnic background. In fact, the Bible says this in Acts 17. For one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. So although we have different ethnic backgrounds, truly we are all of one race. What is that? It's the human race. No more, no less. You know, what a difference it makes in this world. Just think and imagine this for a minute. If we could begin to view one another, regardless of our cultural background, as to the eyes of God. Woo, how great would that be? You see, we're all God's children, created in His image. And for His glory, what a difference. What a great difference it would just be if we as followers of Christ would begin simply to love God and love one another. As Martin Luther King Jr. eloquently said, he said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So now we know that Jesus not only broke down cultural barriers and racial barriers, but he also broke down traditional barriers. Let's take note of verses 20 through 24. Another shift in the conversation. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship when we Samaritans claim that it's here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship? And Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit, as those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So we learned that one of the big issues between the Jews and the Samaritans, aside from any racial prejudice that we talked about, was that of their worship traditions. The Jews maintained that true worship had to happen over there in Jerusalem where the temple was. And yet the Samaritans, they pointed over there to Mount Gerizim. They said, out there west of the town of Sychar, they said, that's where our ancestors worship. But here we find that Jesus breaks through those traditional barriers. He says, our fathers worship in these mountains. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And then Jesus said this to her. Woman, believe me, an hour is coming but neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. John 4, 
So Jesus kind of disarmed the whole situation there. He says it's not about locality. It's not about your residence. It's about your relationship. God's Spirit. And those who worship Him are to worship in spirit and the truth. These are the ones that the Father is looking out to be His worshipers. These are the ones He's seeking to be in relationship with. You see, oftentimes our, our traditions can just become a major barrier to fulfilling the very mission which Jesus has called us. Jesus even had some strong words towards some of the religious leaders of the day. He declared that their transgressions, that they transgressed the commandment of God for the sake of their tradition. They said that they shut people off from the kingdom because of their hypocrisy. That they're so worried about their traditions that it was like they strained out a gnat and swallowed a camel. So you see, if we're going to live like Jesus lived, we must come to the realization, brothers and sisters, that this life that we live is not bound up by religious rituals that is fulfilled in the relationship. It's not about our traditions. It's not about our preferences. It's not about our likes or our dislikes. It's not a particular style or a particular posture or a particular location. None of that matters. It's all about the heart of the worshiper and the connection we have with the Father through the Son and the Spirit. These are the ones, Jesus says, that the Father is seeking to be his worshipers. So if we're going to live like Jesus lived, I hope you get the message here, we've got to break down through those social barriers of our day. I said earlier we're going to talk about two truths. The second is this. Jesus brings our focus now from the physical to the spiritual. I'm going to go back to verse 10. And read verses 10 through 14. Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very, very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoy? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Boy, those are some potent words, are they not? You know, water is a key necessity in life, and we all agree on that. Second only to oxygen. There's survival experts out there, and they tell you something about the rule of three. They say that you can only go about three minutes without having oxygen. And you could go maybe about three days without water. And you could go upwards of about three weeks without having any food. This woman was coming to draw her water from the well that she needed for her physical life. And Jesus recognized that. But he shifted the conversation, you see, from the physical over to the spiritual. He said, whoever drinks this water will thirst again. It may quench your thirst for the time being, but not for long. I'll offer you something that will quench the thirst of your soul forever and ever and ever, for eternity. And how long is eternity? It has no end. Amen. Boy, if we're going to live like Jesus lived, brothers and sisters, we've got to shift our focus a little bit. We've got to Shifted from the physical to the spiritual. You know, Scripture teaches us this. Since we as followers of Jesus, having been raised up with Christ, we are to keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. 
We are to set, set our, our, our minds on things above, not on the things of this earth. In fact, Corinthians 3, 1, 3 tells us that. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven and the things of earth. For you die to this life and your real life is hidden in Christ and God. And then the apostle, the apostle Paul wrote this in Corinthians. This is what he said, quote, Look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So as we begin to live like Jesus lived, we must shift our focus from the physical to the spiritual, from the temporary to the eternal. Let me, let me try and illustrate it this way for you. Like the woman at the well, we all have a bucket. Now many buckets come in different sizes and shapes. Some of them are plastic and some of them are aluminum or some sort of gal galvanized steel or some sort. And oftentimes we become dissatisfied with our bucket. So let's get rid of it. Let's go out and get something brand new, you know real shiny and sparkling, and that's going to do the trick for us. Man, that new bucket's going to just fill us up. Bigger bucket. That'll make things better. Or maybe we think it'd be better if we just get us a tiny little bucket. That way we can just downsize and simplify a little bit. Find that least little bucket that we can. Not have too much to worry about. But that doesn't seem to work, so now what are we going to do? Well, instead of that wee little bucket, we're, we'll trade that in now. Get us a strong, reliable five-gallon bucket. That's to take a big old five-gallon bucket out to the trip. Or maybe we don't want that plastic bucket anymore. And we go out to purchase a nice new galvanized bucket. That's going to see us right on through our golden years. And on and on it goes. But I want to tell you something. Brothers and sisters, and I want you to listen closely. Listen closely. It's not about the bucket. The problem is you're drawing water from the wrong well. Amen. There it is. The water that you're drawing may quench your thirst for a little while, but you're going to thirst again. And Jesus offers water that will quench your thirst forever. And how long is forever? Again, no end. Quench your thirst forever. When we come to the well of Jesus, we're going to receive water that becomes a well of water in us, bringing us up to eternal life. Amen. That's our goal. Amen. 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 Reminds me of the proclamation that Jesus made over in John 7. I won't ask you to turn over there. This is where it says, at 7, 37 and 38, if you want to, Jesus promises living water. In John 7, 37 and 38, it says this, on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And the feast that's referred to here in these uh, verses is known as the Feast of Booths are also known as the Feast of Tabernacles, you see. It was kind of a celebration, a remembrance of God's provision in the wilderness for 40 years, if you know that story. Mm -hmm. Water and food were pretty scarce, but God still provided for his people. And during the last day of this celebration, the great day of the feast, the priest, they, they'd make a procession from the temple over to uh, the pool of Siloam. And they drew water there. They bring it back. They poured it out as a drink offering before the altar. And as they poured out this offering, they would recite Isaiah 12, 3, which says this, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. There's that word again. So this is the occasion. The 
sitting right here in John 7 37. That we just read. Let's look at that text again. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink, for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And we know from the very next verse that rivers of living water is a reference. It's a reference to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. It's the Spirit that brings life, eternal life. And this is the offer that Jesus made to the woman at the well. And she got it. Too many don't get it today, but she got it. Amen. Wow. Jesus totally transformed her life. The woman that was seeking love, a little acceptance, maybe some compassion, she got it. You know, she never even drew water out of the well. Let's look at verse 28. The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone. Oh, how sweet is that? If we could just be like that and run back to our village and tell everyone. She left her water pot, brothers and sisters. She hurried back to the city to tell everybody that. That she been a long way all about Jesus. <laughs> That's the same offer that Jesus makes to us today. It's the same offer that we're called to make to the community in which we live. Revelation 22, 17 says this, Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. What a great message. You know, I think maybe it would just be fitting for me to kind of finish up this message with you this morning. Let me read you that little bit from that Open Windows devotion. You may have read it some months ago. It reads like this. In the heat of the warm fall day, nothing tastes better than a cool drink of water from a well. Wells access groundwater flowing in deep underground aquifers, and water drawn from those places is often fresher and sweeter than water running through the faucet or gathered along the surface of the ground. When Jesus sat down with the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, he asked her for a drink, as Jesus often did. He used the water they were drinking as an analogy for salvation and for the spiritual refreshment that wants to bring each and every one of us. Just a physical water quenches our parched thumb, tongue. Jesus' presence quenches our thirsty soul. The water Jesus gives us, however, is more than just a one-time thing. It's more than a one-time offer. It comes with a challenge to drink continuously. And the more we drink from his word, the more we become a well ourselves with life-giving spiritual water to be poured out of us for others. Well, I know I've kept you quite a while today, but you know, I'd be remiss without offering an invitation. So in closing, I want to ask you to think about what we talked about today. Your relationship, friendship with God is there for the asking. And I tell you, if you don't have a relationship with God, I just pray that it's something that you will consider. And now is the time that you want to make a change in your life. We welcome you to the altar. Myself and Fred would be pleased to pray with you. Anyone that's not here that has not accepted that gift of salvation, 
Recognize the sacrifice that was given for each one of us. Think about giving your heart to Jesus and your health. It will be the best decision to your own name. I hope the next time that you pick up a glass of water and take a drink and think back to the day a little bit. You know, at least take that home with you today. There's no great secrets. In these letters from God's Fred will say, in this roadmap that God has provided us, there's no big secret. A lot of great stories and passages in here. You can just dig in any place. You're going to be blessed with some words, I think. Help you make it through the day. Like my friend said to me this week, did he see in me? But he thought I was worthy of saving my soul. Let's take a moment of reflection.